everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so me. much. It sure is. Thank you for uh, giving us some of your uh, evening to be with us tonight. Um, I'm still pinching myself a little bit that I'm here in beautiful Boulder area of Colorado and that one of my first official duties as high school director is to uh, introduce Karma and Eric to all of you and this presentation information about this upcoming Nepal trip in spring of 2022. So before we get into the presentation, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background if you haven't heard any uh, whisperings in the community. Um, before I do that, I'll just give um, a couple reminders. We have some other events coming up in the next several weeks that you might want to be a part of. One is coming up on July 31st, and that's at 11 a.m. That's going to be a meet and greet with uh, as many of the high school faculty as um, are able to make it just to hear, get to meet them in person. We have many new faces joining us, including me. I'll be there and um, we'll hear about the new uh, courses and sort of the plan for the, the coming year. Um, very informal, very casual, but uh, if you can make it on the 31st, I would love to meet you. Uh, then we also have an open house event that will be in mid-August. Uh, I would wait for confirmation, but I have the 14th down as a tentative date for that. And again, that's 11 a.m. And that will be even more information about uh, what's new uh, at Shining Mountain Waldorf High School. So um, if you're around, please pop by, introduce yourself, say hello, and I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Um, in regard to this trip though, this is um, a trip that's been developed in concert with uh, Karma and Eric uh, as a capstone trip for our new South Asian Studies course. And that will be a four week course, uh, a block taught by Karma Sherpa and, um, let me just get my notes here, and Eric of Sherpa Mountain Adventures. Um, and the purpose of this trip is is, is many, right? So it's we're culminating this South Asian studies block. It's an opportunity for students to participate in this cultural, um, educational and service exchange between our school and schools in um, Taxindo Monastery and Chilemo Village School. It's also an opportunity for the students to experience the life of some of the remote Himalayan peoples through a two night homestay. It will include a trek within the world's most beautiful natural places and embrace the ethic of environmental stewardship, uh, at, which as you know, is a, a tightly held value of uh, Shining Mountain. And we will apply learned mindfulness practices. So there's kind of a lot of benefits to this trip. We are going to answer your questions uh, toward the end of the presentation. We will open the chat box and you can type your questions there. And then either Karma, Eric, Mary, uh, someone who's been around a little bit longer than myself most likely will answer those for you to the best of their ability. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce and thank Karma Sherpa, founder and CEO of Sherpa Mountain Adventures and Eric Scholz, Everest, um, what is this title? Re Everest Region Trekking Guide. So thank you both for being here and I will pass it on to you. Sure. I, I guess this is uh, my turn, right? Is, is that right? Okay. Uh, namaste everybody uh, uh, and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm delighted to meet all of you uh, my name is Karma Sherpa, and then uh, and I was born and raised in the southern part of uh, Mount Everest region of Nepal. Uh, I started working in the tourism industry since 1995, and have been operating many successful trips throughout the Himalaya region. I came to Colorado first time in 1999. Uh, to learn and experience Western culture. After visiting here several times, I fell in love with the mountain of Colorado and the people. So I decided to, to live here permanently since 2001. 
And had, I have been living with my family here in Border County for over 20 years. Uh, this whole journey allowed me to understand the importance of different cultural experience and their, uh, their values. So we are very uh, excited to welcome uh, Shiny Mountain High School student to, uh, to my native homeland and share our unique culture. We love to connect you with my family, friends, and community with which I have a deep connection. Uh, through this connection, you will have an opportunity to directly observe our century old tradition and also the natural beauty of the Himalayas. I think this uh, cultural exchange program will be mutually beneficial. And also this trip will provide you a once in a lifetime experience. Thank you so much for listening to my short story. And thank you so much uh, to Shiny Mountain uh, School giving us an opportunity to connect these two community that I love. We have so many exciting things to share with you this evening. And now Eric will walk you through the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karma. It's so good to hear from you. And we are so excited to have this um, collaboration together now that, that we have this exchange with, with you, with your family founded um, organization, Sherpa Mountain Adventures, and that you become now more a part of our Shining Mountain community too. So it's really um, something special and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. Hello everyone, um, I think it's my turn and uh, I'm looking at karma. So I'll just keep staring at karma, <laughs> hoping people can see me okay. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm very excited to uh, walk you through this trip and uh, what we're going to be doing in the Himalaya as far as the cultural immersion aspect to it, the trekking, the environmental stewardship, and uh, just the life-changing adventure that um, really happens to everybody that travels over there um, and is perfect for this age of student. And uh, so for me, I've been involved with Shining Mountain in various ways. I've been a, a parent of a Shining Mountain student. I am the husband of a Shining Mountain teacher. I occasionally work at Shining Mountain and, and help um, with the grounds and that kind of stuff. And so uh, Shining Mountain and the, the philosophy is deeply embedded in my heart and has been for some time. And so it's just so exciting to connect um, Nepal, Sherpa Mountain Adventures and Shining Mountain School and to create something really unique and special um, for years and years to come. So I'm going to start um, with a little bit of a, the initial presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are and what Sherpa Mountain Adventures actually is. So I'm going to go to screen share. And should be enabled. And if anyone chooses to, you could um, select speaker view if you'd like. If it's a little less distracting for the presentation, that's an option that you can choose. There you go. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yep. Fantastic. So uh, this is actually a, a photograph looking over the, the region that we're talking about. Um, and actually, if you look under adventuring beyond and within, Right under the D is a peak there, and that is Mount Everest. Um, and to the right of that is Lhotse, which is the fourth highest mountain in the world. So uh, this is kind of the area that we're talking about. And uh, 
as you can see, it's a pretty spectacular place. And our tagline, adventuring beyond and within, I think is completely appropriate because adventuring through the Himalaya, obviously the magnificent um, natural beauty, the culture, the people, it's just extraordinary. And we could spend five hours here going over it and never quite um, getting the point across until you go there. But the other piece about it is adventuring within because that is every bit as important um, as anything else when we go there to Nepal. And a person can't help but explore themselves within. Um, mentally, physically, um, what they choose to think about, feel, what their perceptions of the world is and seeing other cultures um, and other people live their lives in such a radically different way is fundamentally altering. Uh, there's no escaping that. And so it changes us um, within as well. Um, so it is the magic of the Himalaya, the culture, the people, the world's tallest mountains. Um, and welcome to the trip of a lifetime. Uh, this is a photograph of the Everest region. To the right is Kalapatar. And uh, the massif ahead of us there is the Mount Everest massif. And you can see Mount Everest about halfway through there poking its head up. And this is a monastery, Tengboshi Monastery um, in that region. So tonight we're gonna go over who we are, why Sherpa Mountain Adventures, the purpose of this trek, the itinerary, cultural immersion, service and reciprocity, the trek to Sacred Milk Lake, and Q&A and discussion afterwards. Uh, who we are. So Sherpa Mountain Adventures is a Sherpa family owned and operated guiding company. Now, just to be clear from the start, we Westerners sometimes confuse what the definition of Sherpa is. Most Westerners believe that Sherpa means the person that carries heavy loads, particularly up 8,000 meter peaks, including Mount Everest, and seeing pictures of Sherpas with the heavy loads and taking on clients up through the Kambu Ice Fall and things of that nature. That is true, but Sherpa is an ethnic group of people. The people that carry the loads are porters, and it just so happens at the highest elevations that the Sherpa ethnic group are the perfect people to be in that role. Um, just the way genetically um, they've adapted over time, uh, the way they process oxygen, unlike anybody else on the planet. And they're, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, superhuman status. Um, you see that and you witness it with your own eyes and it's just unbelievable. And so I wanna say, just to be really clear about that, that Sherpa is an ethnic group of people and Karma is um, from the Sherpa ethnic group. And so his family um, has owned and operated this kiting company for about 25 years. And uh, Karma lives here, but the rest of the entirety of the Sherpa team are in Kathmandu or the upper reaches of the Himalaya. So there are offices in Superior and Kathmandu. The mission of Sherpa Mountain Adventures is a little bit different than your traditional guiding company. Um, it's to reciprocally impact the lives of regional Sherpa peoples and the adventurers who visit. So it is a reciprocal symbiotic relationship between the people that go there and the people there. And a big part of that is serving rural Sherpa communities through volunteerism and support. So Sherpa Mountain Adventure does many things um, to help the community over there, anywhere from the medical clinic that we operate every year, where about 45 volunteers go over, doctors, nurses, optometrists, dentists, and we set up um, a medical clinic at Taksim New Monastery, which you'll be seeing shortly. And people walk for days and days to come there and be seen by our clinicians. And uh, again, you know, environmental stewardship, our Sherpa team worked on rebuilding a trail up to Milk Lake this year, um, which was really exciting. We do cleanup projects, all kinds of things like that. So it's a very different guiding company. It's pretty much a nonprofit. We're just not an actual nonprofit. Um, but that's the altruism that comes through from this organization and from Karma and everyone else um, across the, the breadth of the team there. And so that's who we are. Just why Sherpa Mountain Adventures yeah, Karma and the crew have been doing this for 25 years and uh, grew up born and raised there for generations. And uh, they know everybody there. And you, you can't go 
trekking up to Mount Everest without you know, Karma's brother Nima stopping and saying hi to everybody. He reminds me of my father who was a used car salesman in Pennsylvania. Everybody knew my dad. It's the same way there. <laughs> um, it's an unmatched ethic of service and reciprocity. And I had touched on, base on that with just the, the service aspect of Sherpa Mountain Adventures. Safe and healthy food and water. That is really kind of a, a linchpin to Sherpa Mountain Adventures and keeping our clients safe over there. So we, unlike most guiding companies, we have our own cooks that come with us and cook our food as we go so that we have strict food discipline and to make sure that our clients don't get sick from bacteria. And the same with, with water. So we boil all of our own water. It's not dependent on anybody else. And we have control over that to, to really minimize any risk of coming ill. We have a superior and experienced Sherpa support team. And again, that comes back not, the, there's two aspects to that. For one, serving the clients and serving them well, but also the focus of this enterprise is to hire as many Sherpa staff people as humanly possible so that we can invest in the economy there and these individuals can feed their families for the year. You know, the average income in Nepal last year, which was its, or the year before, which was its highest, was $960 US for a year income. So, you know, that's not a lot of money by our standards. And so our investing in hiring as many Sherpa guides as humanly possible really helps feed a lot of families and invest in that um, economy. So it does operate much like a nonprofit service. And just so people know, yeah, this isn't a one-off thing. You know, Karma and the team we do Annapurna, Bhutan, Everest Base Camp, Three Pass, Three Peak. We do technical climbs, um, Island Peak. We do our medical mission, um, meditation treks, individualized trips and treks. So this is not a, a new um, fly-by-night organization by any stretch. And I just want people to know that, that Karma and the team have been doing this for a very long time. And there is no detail that they don't have dialed in um, in our treks over there. And so the purpose um, of the annual Sandy Mountain Waldorf trip to Nepal, as Jamie already touched on, is to culminate the South Asian Studies Block, to participate in a cultural, educational, and service exchange between Shiny Mountain and the schools of Tax Hindu Monastery and Chilemo Village School, to experience the life of remote Himalayan peoples through a two-night homestay, and to trek through one of the world's most beautiful natural places and embrace the ethic of environmental stewardship. And also for our students to go over there is to apply learned mindfulness practices that we'll be going over in the block um, in January. With that, before we go further, I would like to invite um, Alex, who is, oops, where did you go? Could someone who knows this better than me let Alex have voice? There we go. I think that did it. Alex, can you talk? There we go. Yep. There we go. I got Please. it. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Yeah. So, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Beal. I graduated from Shining Mountain in 2014. I was there um, K through 12 and had an amazing experience and just so happened to go on one of these treks in 2018 um, on the same route. Which, uh, which Eric has been describing. So I have a, a view, viewpoint from both um, sides of this lovely uh, meeting that's, that's happening right here and thought I'd just share my thoughts um, on both my education and the, the trip that I went on. So I think um, what's unique about this specific trip is it's not like a trip to Moab or Mexico or Europe where you can kind of get around comfortably. You can read street signs, you can make your way through um, through somewhere. I mean, when I landed in Nepal, it was completely foreign. You can't read the signs, you can't communicate, and you're kind of forced to adapt and take on a certain sense of self-governance, which I think you're not in, in other situations. Um, and I think despite all of the, the different worlds you enter, you, you start to realize that we all sing, we all dance, we all make art, and yet the, the unique thing is the cadence in which we, we all do it in. 
And um, I think we, you get to see a different viewpoint of reality and the environment that you interact with. Um, so I think coming home, you start to realize that your, your viewpoint of what reality is and, and how you interact with it is vastly different from someone um, on the other side of the world. And, uh, and it gives you a choice to make your own choices in how you interact with the daily world and, and make progress. Um, so I had an amazing experience at both Shining Mountain and on my trip to, to Nepal. Um, and I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that you guys have about either as a student or, um, or the adventures in Nepal. Um, and I think lastly, it just gave me a great appreciation for, um, for labor and for self-governance. Um, I think you see people who work in a capacity that you just don't have regard for here in Boulder. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the academics you learn at Shining Mountain. So I think um, the lessons you come back with from Nepal uh, meld well with, with the academics you have at Shining Mountain. Great. Alex, thank you for being here. It's really nice to see you and, and appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. Great. Can you folks hear me? I think you can. Um, okay. All right. And so with that, we'll jump into what this trek, um, this trip entails. So here is just a quick overview of the itinerary, and we'll go into a little bit more detail of this. But so it's Wednesday the 30th, which is most of the way or partway through the second week of spring break. Um, next week, yeah, next year. And most departures from DIA leave in the evening. And we'll be coordinating this so that everyone's on the same flight. And uh, then it's, um, uh, it's quite a flight. It's an average, it, it depends. You can take the Atlantic route, the Pacific route. I've done both. Um, and, but your average trip is usually about 26, 27, 28 hours. And so it covers two nights. And typically, I've always arrived in Kathmandu in the morning. And so that'll happen on the first. Um, we'll, the arrivals will, will all arrive there. Um, so pretty much in the morning, it could be as you know, early afternoon. And uh, then our team will pick us up at the airport and take us to the hotel in Kathmandu. Um, so there should be some time to explore a little bit in Kathmandu that afternoon, evening. And we'll overnight at the hotel. Uh, Saturday morning, we take a drive, an expedition drive um, from Kathmandu to Poplu. It's about eight to 10 hours, and we'll overnight in lodges in Poplu. Sunday the 3rd, we start trekking. Um, and we'll trek 8.5 miles from Poplu to Taksindu. We'll have a monastery welcome ceremony that evening and overnight in lodges. Day um, four on the 4th is the Taksindu Monastery School Work and Cultural Exchange Day. We'll also hold overnight in lodges there. Now, Tuesday morning, we'll spend half a day volunteering at the monastery school and have lunch. And then after lunch, we'll descend to Chilemo and uh, to the, we'll visit the Chilemo school in the village. And uh, we'll hang out there, have snacks and food and whatnot and work at the school. And then we'll start the first of two overnights with Sherpa families. And I'll go into more detail about that. On Wednesday, we'll have a full work day at the Chilemo village and the school. And we'll also overnight again with Sherpa families. On Thursday, the 7th, uh, we'll start our jungle trek from Chilemo, uh, Chilemo to Sakaripati, which is about five and a half hours and we'll overnight in tents. On the 8th, we'll trek from Sakaripati to Bene, which is about approximately six hours. And we'll also overnight in tents again. On the 9th, we'll trek from Beni and go up to the Sacred Milk Lake, which is the highest point of the trek, which is right at about 15,000 feet. So it'll be higher than any of these young people have probably ever been. Um, and then we'll return back to Beni and overnight in tents at Beni Base Camp. On the 10th, we'll trek from Beni to Sansari and we'll overnight in tents again. On the 11th, we'll trek from Sansari to Jumbesi, which is the largest Sherpa village in that um, region should be about three to four hours. And we'll stop halfway and we'll visit the Tuchinboli Monastery, which is just a fantastic place. And I'll, I'll show you pictures of that. And then we'll be back overnighting in lodges. 
On the 12th, 12th we'll trek from Jumbesi to Paplu. And that evening at Paplu, we'll stay in lodges and we'll have a nice big celebration party um, for what we've just accomplished. That next morning, uh, we'll fly from Paplu to Kathmandu and uh, we'll explore in Kathmandu and have some downtime there and uh, to be able to see the sights and walk around. And uh, oops, we'll overnight at the hotel that night. On the 14th, we'll do, um, we'll visit uh, several Kathmandu cultural sites. The Budhanath, which is a very large temple, uh, very sacred temple, historic temple, and also the monkey temple and overnight at the hotel. On the 15th, departure's home and we'll arrive home on the 16th. And for any families that want a copy of this, I'm happy to get that to them. So here's Southeast Asia. Uh, you can see India there, Tibet, China, um, and you see Nepal um, in the middle there. And uh, you can see the Himalaya as a, as a huge smile on planet Earth. And that's exactly what it is. Um, all the way from uh, Pakistan to the left. Um, and you can see it go, the Himalaya curve around, go across Bhutan um, there on the right. And so we'll be going right about where the um, the end is, is right about where Kathmandu is. And all trips start with one of these signs at the airport. And it's one of my favorite things to see because it means we're on our way. Um, day one, we arrive in Kathmandu. Um, and as I said, most inter international flights arrive in the morning or early afternoon. Um, we'll be met at the airport, you know, um, answer any questions that we that anyone might have. Once we get to the hotels and we have some time to get any last supplies we need, anything like that, um, in case somebody's forgot something, then that evening we'll have dinner and a briefing about what's happening next um, for our trip. There's some rickshaws that uh, you'll see, um, your children will see a lot of those over there. So here's some street scenes from Kathmandu um, in the Tamil uh, tourist district. And it's a vibrant, beautiful market um, area of Nepal. And uh, it's just amazing um, to take in the sights, the sounds, the smells. Oh, it's just so rich at every turn of the head. And uh, it's an amazing place. Some more street scenes. I love the, um, the cabbage bowls that are made there. You see it in that bottom center. Um, so yeah, I mean, talk about environmentally friendly. Um, it's uh, bowls to eat out of that are you know, completely biodegradable and made of vegetables. It's fantastic. I just love this picture. It's three guys and a monkey hanging out, <laughs> just sitting around. Um, you see plenty of monkeys around there. There's a lot of monkeys um, in the Kathmandu area, and on the, sometimes on the streets um, of Kathmandu. And uh, so common that it doesn't even get uh, a local's attention. So here's uh, from an overpass, just kind of uh, what the traffic looks like on a, on a given day. Then we get ready to start our trip. So our luggage is packed um, as we leave the hotel. Now we only take things up with us that we need on the trip and the trek. So anything that comes over on our flight, luggage, you know, uh, things of that nature that you don't need or that a, a student or anyone doesn't need stays locked up at the hotel and is completely safe. And then we can pick that up when we come back. So we only take what's necessary on the trip above. So this is a picture of the Himalaya. Um, to the left, you can see the little red point. Um, that is Kathmandu. And that is the road that we'll be taking the, and traveling to the right. And on the right end of the screen, you can see it go up towards the mountainous area of the Himalaya. And that's the area that we'll be staying and trekking. And to the right there is actually Mount Everest. So, that day, it's hard to say. I mean, it's a, you've probably seen movies or things of, of treks in remote areas. 
And so you don't know if a road's gonna be washed out temporarily or something like that, or it's hard to cross a river or the Jeeps. Um, so we predict anywhere from eight to 10 hours of, of the Jeep ride through the countryside. And as you can see to the left, the elevation, um, we start to really climb about two thirds of the way through the day. And here's another just um, visual of from going from Kathmandu up to our trekking routes. Those, the, the colored um, area there are the different aspects of the trek we'll be on. So day two, we drive to Poplu. As you can see, this is uh, pictures of that journey. Um, we'll Jeep ride expedition style through the rivers and valleys and foothills. Um, upon arrival in Poplu, we'll eat dinner and stay overnight in lodges. There. I apologize for my barking dog in the distance. Um, here's some pictures of Poplu. Um, it's a sizable area I mean, you know, relative to rural Himalaya. But um, here's uh, just some uh, visuals of that area. And I loved, I, I took this picture of some uh, folks playing volleyball um, in the left and you can see the valley dropping off. They'd moan and groan whenever the ball would roll off that side and they'd you know, force the youngest person to have to run down the hill to get the ball. That's pretty funny. <laughs> um, so here's a, a closer look at where we'll be trekking. So these colors that you see in the center of the screen is our trekking routes. And that's the top of the world right behind us there. And um, the, the colored ones to the right there, that's the Everest treks and going up to Mount Everest. So we're, as you can see, we're very close to Mount Everest and we're very close to that region. And uh, that's where we're going. And uh, I guess you can't see my mouse if I use it, but if you look at the, the colored areas in the center, at the very top of it, the last one you see is a little blue um, line and that's the Sacred Milk Lake. So that'll be the apex of our trek. And it's right under that beautiful massive. So step one um, is day three, and it's our trek from Poplu to Taksindu. And so this is what it looks like on the map. And so we'll be trekking along this trail and we'll stop and we'll lunch um, about halfway in Para and we'll hike up to what's called Ringmu and then cross the Taksindu La. La means pass, so um, it's the Taksindu Pass and we'll drop down into Taksindu. So that day, this says 9.14 miles. It's the best I could do with this map. It's actually more like about eight and a half mile um, hike that day. So after breakfast, we'll trek to Para and uh, have lunch there. And we'll follow the trail along the Dudkosi River and enjoy the landscape before reaching Ringmu. After a brief rest, we'll trek over 10,000 foot Taksindu La and drop into the village and monastery of Taksindu. So these are some pictures of that portion of the trek. And in the bottom right is a picture of Taksindu um, where we'll wind up that day and where we'll spend a few days. So Taksindu Monastery is at 9,324 feet. After leaving Ringmu, we'll hike through Rhododendron Forest and reach Tatsukasindula. And the views are spectacular. Um, of Numbur, Kantaga, Kelong. We'll also see very old stupa and monuments along the way. And we'll gradually descend to the village of Taksindu. Uh, this evening at Taksindu Monastery, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll have a, um, a ceremony with the monks of the monastery. So this, the large picture is overlooking Taksindu. And uh, the, the little compound there on the right, that is the monastery grounds. The tents, that's from our medical clinic when we were there last time. Um, but that's the, the monastery and the school. Now you see the large long part of the school um, with its back towards the drop off um, with the yellow tent right in front of it. So that's the Taksindu school and it was destroyed in the earthquake. And going back to the mission and focus of Sherpa Mountain Adventures, um, Karma and Sherpa Mountain Adventures played a, a, 
I won't say totally did it, but close to totally rebuilt that entire structure um, for the school and for the monastery after the earthquake. And uh, so again, that's the kind of stuff that Triple Mountain Adventures is always throwing themselves into. So that's where we'll be for a few days and working. Um, you can see a lodge there in the middle. Um, there's one at the bottom left, a lodge, and there's one more you can't see, which would be bottom right. And so we'll be staying at one of those lodges. In the evening, we'll arrange a ceremony at the monastery. Um, the monks and nuns will lead this ceremony and we'll be able to hear the chanting and the prayers. And that's a picture of inside the monastery and monks um, in prayer. So day four is a service work day at Toxindu School. Um, the students will either get their hands dirty building structures, working the grounds, or cleaning and organizing facilities. Students will participate in a variety of educational and cultural exchange groups with the monks of the Toxindu Monastery School. And the monks of the school range anywhere from about five years old to you know, the end of high school age and now beyond because the monastery has actually built a college so that um, young monks don't have to leave and go to India to study and pursue um, becoming a monk or a lama. Um, they can do that right there and stay even longer. But here's some pictures of that. Um, an integrated soccer match, uh, the most scenic soccer field in the world will certainly break out after hours that evening, I guarantee it. That is a soccer field. And uh, it's pretty amazing. You can see uh, the monks playing on it that evening um, at the bottom right as well. So, and it's just some pictures um, of the different monks there and hanging out. And the bottom left is a group of our um, clients and uh, staff uh, doing exercise and yoga um, all together. And so we'll be doing those kind of things together with the students. Some more photos of Toxindu and what it looks like from those grounds. As you can see, it's a spectacularly stunning place. And the monks are, <laughs> the monks definitely are not serious all the time. <laughs> um, we have a lot of fun together, that's for sure. So day five would be a service morning at the Toxindu school. And after lunch, like I said earlier, we'll hike to Chilemo village and we'll spend the afternoon working at the Chilemo school, visiting our staff's families and enjoying traditional shupa foods and drinks. In the evening, we'll arrange two night homestays of two students per home which is very fun and deep cultural immersion into the lives of the Sherpa people. To me, that's been the best part of all my trips going over there um, is spending the night um, at that house in the, the middle top there is um, where I slept at Passan's house. He's one of our lead guides and uh, spending the night there with his family was life-changing experience for me. And I had already been over there four or five times. Um, so, I'm so thrilled that Karma is organizing it so that all of our students can do not one, but two nights homestays with the Sherpa families there. So we'll be working there um, and uh, doing things at the, the school. So here's some pictures of um, some folks living there, um, some of our clients in a Sherpa home. Uh, the top right is some members of Karma's family. I think you, re you recognize those faces, Karma. <laughs> um, and here's some pictures. So these were I took staying, spending the night at um, Pasong's house. Um, so a typical Sherpa house there is two stories and the lower story, like the photo in the middle top um, is where they store a lot of their goods, supplies, their fuel for the winter, yak dung, um, firewood, things of that nature, where they can bring animals in if they need to in inclement weather. And then the upstairs is one big room. And uh, that's where everyone cooks. You can see the kitchen in the top left um, and Passan's family. And uh, you can see the kitchen down there in the, the bottom right as well. And then we, at night, we sleep on benches and on the floor. And that's what all our students will be doing. Um, being with the families and doing that. So 
This is just a kind of a map uh, if you're looking straight down at our trekking routes. And so I just, I wanna start each map with this just to point out kind of where we're at. Um, and so I forgot I can't really use my mouse, but at the bottom right, you see the light blue um, that goes up to, uh, or you see the red that goes up to Ringmu and then the purple across the lodges and whatnot. And then that blue um, trekking route we'll be diving into next. Daisy, hey. Sorry, Daisy says hi, everybody. So once we leave Chilemo and we start on our trek, we'll leave Chilemo and we don't hike very far. It's only two and a half miles that day, but um, it's quite a bit of elevation gain. And so this is where Sherpa Mountain Adventures just excels because the staff there have it so dialed in as far as acclimatization and how fast to go. So when we trek, we have a Sherpa guide at the front, we have a Sherpa guide at the back, we have guides in the middle, um, and no one gets behind or ahead of a Sherpa guide. And uh, so our lead guide usually, you know, um, you know, could be one of many of them, but just has the pace dialed in so perfectly because you just do, the great thing about Nepal is you do nothing fast, nothing. You don't do it fast, um, which really lends itself to mindfulness. And so that's where it'll be great during trekking, especially to have the youth practice some of the, the mindfulness skills that we'll be going over in January. But so this day, um, you know, we'll take it nice and slow and we trek from uh, Chilemo to Sakaripati. And that ridge that we start going over is just spectacular views of the Everest region. So it's a very slow, steep trek from Chilemo to Sakaripati forest trekking past pneumatic herding encampments and views of the Himalayan mountains. That night, it's about approximately 12,000 feet where we'll set up camp. And uh, um, so we'll just hang out there in the afternoon and the evening, and uh, we'll overnight in tents and see the night sky of the Himalaya from aside our big bonfire that we'll have that night. And so here's some pictures of trekking through that part. Next um, stage is the from the dark blue to the pinkish purple on the right. And that is from Sakaripati over or um, astride Kamala Pass to our base camp called Beni. And so you can see we follow that ridge line and uh, follow that mountainside. And uh, it's about six miles that day with about 3,600 feet of elevation. And so we take it nice and slow. We have lunch midway, lots of breaks, nothing fast. Um, and so we've got a nice um, day to get there at our leisure. And these are a couple pictures from Kamala. And so you can see Mount Everest in the top left. Um, Mount Everest is the one kind of towards the left that's a little bit obscured from clouds. Um, so that's Everest off in the distance. But those are some of the, the views from the trek that day. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hey. Um, then the next day is our, we go up to um, Milk Lake, Sacred Milk Lake. So it's just a little over three miles. It's about a thousand feet of elevation. We've got all day to get up there and back. And uh, so we're at high elevation, but we do everything slow, slow, slow. And uh, this is what it looks like from up there. Um, it's a very spectacular place. And I'm wondering if Karma, you might take just a minute to explain why Milk Lake is so sacred. The the milk lake is a name after because uh, based on the, the uh, based on our ancestor, uh, the milk lake uh, is uh, discovered by uh, the cow. Uh, so the the yak herder uh, would take the, the animal in the summertime up to the mountain and then they uh, uh, let them stay around this, uh, the mountain during the summertime. But then uh, uh, 
So the one uh, yak herder uh, keep missing uh, his uh, yak, uh, the, the female uh, yak, and then uh, very hard to find it. And every day missing it is not coming to the group. And then uh, then one day, you know, uh, the, the owner of this, uh, that yak kind of sneak after this uh, and then and then, uh, and then look, uh, try to find the egg. And then every day the, this yak go to the uh, the 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 area what is the the uh, the lake uh, situated now and then uh, kind of feed the milk to the rock piece of rock every day as a ritual and then then they they said there's some kind of good uh, you know like uh, extraordinary energy there and then that's how from that uh, that day they call this place as a milk lake yeah and then the the lake itself is a milky color and then yeah it's a uh, is something that you know uh, very special to the, the the people in that region and then very sacred. Yeah, and not only that, and then just above the above this lake is uh, three you know sacred mountain or uh, uh, located, and then those mountain are never climbed by any climber so far. It's very sacred to the region. Eric, yeah. I, I muted you during go. that. There you go. Okay, there we go. Okay. And then after we come back and we spend the night again at um, Benny Base Camp, um, we'll trek from Benny to Sansari. And you can see that bright pink line coming down that ridge line. And that is a very spectacular part of the hike. Um, and here's some pictures from that area. Sir Edmund Hillary considered the best views in Nepal from that area when, when they crossed it on their expeditions. And uh, that's where we'll be. And, uh, and fear not, the snow will not be there when we camp in that spot um, in the spring. So if any of you are chaperones, don't worry about that. Then we'll drop down to the next blue line below it. And we'll take the day and we'll trek from Sansari to Jumbasi and you see our elevation drop um, significantly at that point. And halfway through, um, we'll stop at the Tichenbuling Monastery. And that is a spectacular place. Um, it's a large Tibetan monastery um, founded when uh, China um, invaded Tibet and um, the Lama fled from Tibet and stayed in this area and founded this monastery. And it's incredibly beautiful. Um, it's one of the most special places I think I've visited when I was there. And uh, I'll show you a quick little video of it. So here's some pictures of the monastery that I've taken, uh, various monks and nuns. Um, here's in the top left, are um, nuns uh, separating grain, uh, the, the ancient way. And I'll show you a little bit of that. And here's the monastery in the bottom right. And we'll be able to visit there with our students and experience this. <laughs> and then after we leave the monastery, um, we'll trek down to Jumbasi. And uh, then we'll, it's a short trek, and we'll have um, some time to explore, relax. Um, and spend the afternoon um, in the, this beautiful Sherpa village. And then we'll trek, um, uh, we hike from to Poplu that next day. So this is just some of the scenes um, of Pop done the trek to Poplu. And uh, 
that's again the, the map that we're talking about. That bottom green line is the trekking route that we'll be on. Now it's pink. And we'll trek from Jubasi along the river back to Poplu. Here's some sights from that hike. I know everybody wants to come over, huh? <laughs> Um, once we're in Pablo, we'll spend the night there and we'll have our celebration party. And then the next day we fly from Pablo Landing Strip um, back to Kathmandu. And then we transfer to the hotel and can relax and enjoy some time that um, afternoon and evening. The next day we'll be visiting sites um, like the Monkey Temple and the Budinov, the largest stupa in Nepal, um, very old and very sacred. Here's the Budenoff, some pictures of it. It's on the ancient trade route from Tibet, which enters the Kathmandu Valley. So it used to be out in the middle of nowhere. Now, of course, it's, um, it's surrounded by part of the city. And then sadly, on day 15 is our departure from Kathmandu and we transfer to the airport and we complete the journey. Um, so this is the trip costs. Uh, the trip of 15 days in country is $3,000, which includes lodging and breakfasts um, in Kathmandu, all domestic land and air travel, all lodging and meals beyond Kathmandu. Uh, flights usually range um, between 900. I've never seen it as much as 1500, but who knows with the, the COVID, world, COVID world and that kind of stuff, but I've never seen it that amount, but somewhere in that. Um, about 1200 on average. Um, we do require everyone to have trip and, and medical insurance and that's uh, anywhere from 100 to $150. Spending money, you know, two to $300. Um, it's incredibly inexpensive over there. And, uh, you know, that would give more than enough for any student to buy things for the family, to, to purchase meals um, and to have some fun. Um, we also do have a 10% of trip cost as a tip for the, the Sherpa team. And we collect that prior to the trip and we distribute it the night of our celebration party in Poplu. And it goes to our cooks, our Sherpa guides, not, not Western guides, our porters and our herders. So the total trip is about $5,000. All right then, that's about it. I took this photo with my iPhone 6. And I just think it's one of the most incredible photos I've ever seen. Um, so there we go. And with that, I can open it up. Thank you so Eric. much, Eric. Uh, do we have the chat box open now? Yeah, I just opened it. And um, Eric, thank you very much. Um, I, I thought I thought I'd jump in right away while people are um, putting questions in. Um, one of the first questions I imagine is who's paying for this trip. So um, so the way our trips usually work in the high school, we have some you know parents who've been here and some who are new, and um, we have. Um, trip money that's just sort of part of the tuition and then um you know there are different there's different money that's assigned to each class for their trips and then we try to make them as inexpensive as possible i mean i think this is incredibly reasonable for what this experience is five thousand dollars and so there is typically some parent contribution towards a trip. I don't have the exact numbers. I'm so sorry, but this is something that we have to work out a little bit once we, once we have our budget settled. Um, but we do try to cover as much of uh, trip costs as we can. And then, excuse me, my phone. Um, and then there may be um, a need for some parent support of a trip. Um, and then also, um, you know, we don't want anyone not to be able to go on a trip for lack of funds. So, you know, we can look at that. Um, you know, if, if a, a family might need a, a bit more support than another family, we can look at how to do that. Um, so that's, that's what I can give you right now, but we do try to pay for portions of the trips. Um, the seniors will be going to Hermit Island and 
uh, they're going on two pretty significant trips, actually, one really significant one to Nepal, but then also the one to Hermit Island. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the 11th graders are going to Nepal. So that's what I can tell you about that right now. There will be more specific information coming, but it just gives you a sense of we're not asking you to pay $5,000 right off the top. Okay. Um, I'm looking in the chat to see if there's anyone putting questions in. Does it, you know, we're a pretty small group. I also really don't mind if someone just wants to raise your hand and we can unmute you and, and we, you can ask your question. It doesn't have to be in the chat. Here, Sarah has a question. Um, so I'll just read the question. Um, when is the last time you took this trip? Have you traveled since COVID? approximately how many high school student trips have you done? And I think it's important, Eric, to talk about um, the what's happening in terms of uh, the Sherpa community and the vaccination, it, what's happening in that initiative and just be clear about that. Happy to, and uh, Karma might wanna jump in on this too, but so the, the question, there's a few questions I think embedded. I wanna make sure I hit each point, but how many times have we, or when's the last time we've trekked there? Was that a part of it? So the last time we've trekked there was um, the fall before COVID. And um, so that was our, I mean, we've done many, many treks in this region and this particular trek. And so the last time I was there was with our medical clinic when we did this trek and we went there and so, but we've done this trek numerous, numerous times um, with lots of private clients, with our group from medical clinic. And uh, we've not taken a school group that I know, I don't think we've ever taken a school group there before. Um, so that's what's really exciting about this one. Um, and if you don't mind my jumping in, there will also be, Eric will be on the trip, but there will also be two chaperones from our school going as well. And it's a small group of students. So, you know, there'll be plenty of oversight and care for the students on the trip. And as far as the, the COVID aspect, so we've been, uh, Sherpa Mountain Adventures has been uber cautious and erring on the, the, the side of caution now and we've canceled four seasons you know, consecutive seasons and going over there not every trekking company has done that but the last thing we want to do is to have any of our uh, the beautiful sherpa people that host us not just host in the in the houses but host along the trekking routes that are you know that work at the hotels that any way that they would come in contact with us the last thing we want to do is to put anyone in jeopardy um, it's literally not worth making one person sick to take people over there. And so we've been incredibly cautious about that. And the other piece of it is that, um, you know, we've been working very hard on um, working to get people vaccinated over there. And a lot of that is happening as we speak. And uh, so like our team has been um, vaccinated just in the last few days. Um, Johnson & Johnson donated 1.5 million doses to Nepal, I know. And so vaccinations have, are flourishing again. They were put on hold because most of the vaccinations came from India. And then when India blew up with COVID, they weren't sending any over there. But now vaccines are coming, flooding into the country from all places, um, from the United States, from India, from China, from Japan. Um, and so we fully anticipate the region being completely vaccinated um, for spring. And Karma, do you want to add to that? Yes, that's that's correct. So the uh, the government uh, in Nepal, their goal is to complete vaccination by by February or March of uh, two thousand twenty-two. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of uh, vaccination is happening. You know, uh, you know, the, the people are very enthusiastic about getting a vaccination. You know, it's the back right now. You know, as soon as the vaccine comes, you know in a couple of days, it runs out. It's not like here, you know, half people getting, half people not getting. It's not the case there in Nepal. So people are very, very cooperative getting a vaccination. They are very interested, very, you know, uh, yeah. So they are, uh, yeah, they are doing very good job with the vaccination, yeah. Great. Thanks, Karma. 
Did I answer the, the entirety of that question? Did, did we answer yes, that? I believe that that, um, that trip, was, that was answered. Um, are there specific vaccines or health needs that the high schoolers have to meet to travel to Nepal? Mm. And, and Karma, you might want to touch on that a little bit as well. Well, I mean, uh, so in Nepal, so we don't, normally we don't recommend any particular vaccine to just to do the track, uh, just to doing a track going into the mountain. So if you are going to down to India, where there's a warmer climate, then you might, you know, um, you know, usually people need uh, malaria vaccination and things like that. But uh, so I, ha I have been, t you know, uh, operating to for last 25 years and then we really don't recommend particular vaccine unless you know participant doctor recommends it or things like that but uh, you know uh, so you were going to the in the mountain and then uh, you know so we don't accept COVID vaccine I don't you know anticipate you know any requirement from our side, unless, you know, the participants, uh, uh, you know, uh, physician recommends to take it. Uh, so that's what, uh, yeah, that's what we've been doing it over, over this many years. I think with this, um, and I'm just going to jump in here and, and, and you know, Ann, Ann Adelson is here, who is our health safety and risk officer and, and very up to date on um, COVID um, protocols. And, um, you know, I think that we will need to be testing um, before we go to make sure we don't want to send anyone over if they're sick. Um, and I, I don't know who will be and who won't be at this point. So, you know, I think it's something that, um, and do you actually want to speak to this from a school standpoint? Not really, <laughs> just because <laughs> so yeah. much with COVID changes um, and we're right on this edge of a lot of things possibly changing. So no, not right now, but um, the closer we get to, as certainly as we start school, I'll know so much more and then um, we'll keep an eye on things. And as soon as we know um, what the airline might require or leaving the United States might require or um, Nepal might right, require, then, we'll, then we can speak to this. But I think a lot of elements of COVID are changing. And so this will be something we'll just have to keep an eye on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anne, I appreciate that. So, you know, there's, there's more to learn about this as we go along, certainly. Um, you know, just for our school community returning to school, there are still things that, that you know, we need to look at um, from last year to this year, how things will be. Um, and we will certainly keep you posted as, as best we can and, and have more specific information as we move closer. Um, the next question was, as an 11th and 12th grade trip, is it provided every year or every two years? So the way that we set this trip up for this year is that, um, you know, we're thinking of this being an 11th grade trip. Um, the 12th graders traditionally go to Hermit Island for the invertebrate zoology block, the marine biology block. And, um, but we wanted the 12th graders not to miss this trip. So we're sending 11th and 12th to, um, together this year. And then next year, the 11th grade would certainly go to Hermit Island. And then we're thinking of this more of an 11th grade traditional each year trip. That's our thinking at this time. And at Lisa, that was you who asked that question. Um, so the rising 10th this year would then go the next year. Um, how will students prepare physically for the trip? Um, you know, our kids do a lot of hiking and this is something we'll certainly talk about and we will we'll gather information. I think Karma or Eric, you might have thoughts on this. Um, we do have our students hiking and preparing, but one of the things that uh, made a lot of sense to me is how the trek is approached by uh, Sherpa Mountain Adventures. So the gain that they do and the rate at which they do it, they do it very carefully so that altitude sickness does not happen. 
Um, they're not racing up that mountain. Um, you know, each segment of the mountain would be approached at, uh, or the area would be approached depending on what the gain is. So I'm going to stop talking and have either Karma or Eric uh, address yeah, this. Yeah, I, I can touch a little bit. To, to just to give you an idea. So I took my uh, uh, nine years boy and then he did, you know, 14,000 uh, um, uh, feet elevation hike for 10 days without not, not a problem. So he goes to Monarch High School here in Superior, Louisville. And then he did uh, that when he was uh, nine, nine years old. So he loved it and then he always want to go back. So, so our hiking is, you know, not that extreme. And then also we have like a, a like a recommendation what how to train what to do so we can email that to everybody so yeah that should not be a problem uh, you know so nine uh, nine years my boy I took him three times over to Himalaya and then when he was five he was seven he was nine <laughs> you know he he did perfectly fine so I guess the twelve great great and you know, eleven grades should be fine. So we can help how to prepare. You know how to. You know, yeah. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a you know I'm a father of two child, and then I know that you know that we you know we care and then we are you know concerned about the children, and then you know that's why we yeah we make sure that everything goes right and everything is you know safe. Yeah, that's something that we you know, pay a lot of attention mm -hmm. on each trip that we guide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I would imagine that there are people of all different ages who go to trek and of all different physical abilities, um, you know, um, so we'll certainly do all we can to prepare the students so that they're feeling comfortable in their trek. And, um, you know, fortunately, we have very healthy students too, and they do some hiking just regularly anyway with their school and yeah, so thank you. Good question. I appreciate it. Oh, good. That was um, great. Cindy's saying thank you. That was helpful. Um, are there other questions from anyone? I don't see anything more in the chat at the moment. Mary, could I add one thing very quickly and it's along those lines? And yes, I have a slide built into it. I don't know if I inadvertently skipped over it or not, but um, so just around uh, emergency protocols in case something were to happen or if someone didn't feel like they could do a part of the actual trek, um, what our plan B and C and our redundancy is on those scenarios. So first of all, I just want to touch on, and my slide would have said that, is um, prevention, prevention, and all, then some more prevention. Um, and so we do work with all of our clients, and the, the students would be no different around their training beforehand, um, communicating with them. Um, we send gear lists, everything, so that they come prepared with everything they need. Um, and so we'll work with them on their training beforehand, too. What we do, and again, we already touched base on pace and it's all about pace and we stay well within industry and medical standards on elevation gained and timelines. Um, but the big, you know, one of the biggest things we do for prevention, as I already said, is food and water discipline. Uh, we almost never have someone get sick over there from bacteria, um, which is fantastic. And uh, so that's a great thing. And then I, as a guide and our team, what I do in real time over there, everyday hiking, I check in with every participant, morning, during the day, in the evening, and I do welfare checks on them just to see how they're doing mentally, physically, um, how much water they're drinking, food. So we've got eyes on every client all the time and nothing will slip by us. I guarantee you that, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so that's wonderful. If there were to be any kind of an emergency, say somebody did have an accident and fell and broke an ankle or something like that. Um, for one, there are roads through that area, not to exactly where we're going, but getting someone, if somebody couldn't do the trek, for example, um, in Taxindu, they injured themselves and they can't do the trek, then we have a fallback plan on how to get them um, across the valley um, to, to Tembling, 
to Jumbesi and to meet up with the group on that side of the valley as we come down from our trek. And so we have backup plans for that. If there were to be an injury or something, if someone were to hurt themselves in the higher elevations, that is the beauty of Karma and Sherpa Mountain Adventures because they know everyone there. We have satellite phones with us at all times. We're never out of communication. And we can have helicopters come in, fly somebody out to a hospital um, if we needed to um, at the blink of an eye. So there, there literally is nothing that Sherpa Mountain Adventures hasn't done before and isn't prepared to do. So I just wanna make sure people know that. And I'm sorry that that slide got skipped somehow. That's really helpful, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question in the chat. Melanie is saying the video of the ladies with the grain were all wearing masks. Was this during COVID? A beautiful video. Um, and also this presentation was also beautiful. Thank you, Melanie also said. Actually, that was before COVID. That was just so that they didn't breathe in the dust from separating the grains. Um, and so it had nothing to do with COVID um, whatsoever. That was uh, the fall before COVID was ever even heard of on our planet, so. Good question, Melanie. Even now, you know, <laughs> if you go to like a most uh, like a, uh, the uh, Asian country, people use masks frequently even before the, before the pandemic come, you know. So they just try to kind of, you know, pre preventing from flu and things like that. This is not a, you know, unusual thing in Nepal or in other country, they, they love to use some masks, you know, whether from the pollution or things like that, they, they always been using that, you know. Which we are learning here is helpful. You know, I'm just thinking about, regardless of COVID with flu seasons and cold seasons and being out and about, I, I will certainly have a mask more often than I ever did before. Um, I want to just say that um, Cindy Wiedemann, who had asked about, um, you know, the students preparing physically for the trip, and, and she said the, um, that it was awesome and very reassuring, the information that was just provided. So thank you for that. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? Anything else that you'd like to know about, wondering about? I have a question. Can, yeah. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the food, the traditional or, or typical food that would be uh, enjoyed on this trip? Eric, are you going to touch on that? Or? I'll, let, I'll let Karma touch on that because my dog is barking again. <laughs> yes. So we, you know, our uh, private chef, they are well trained to you know, uh, to prepare food based on the Western test. And then also we, you know, we, we kind of combine with some local dishes, but then very based on, you know, mild and then, you know, very, you know, pleasant to enjoy for Western climb. So we, uh, yeah, we also have like uh, some continental dis dishes. We have a lot of, uh, we don't do the same food like, uh, you know, whole trip. So we have, lot of different selection you know if you are eating dinner maybe you know five six different items will be prepared every day every night so you know so myself also it has been in the food industry and then i'm trained about how to handle the you know food hygienically here in united states you know that's why i have the knowledge about the food you know importance so that's how you know, our entire team or train, and then given uh, like a briefing every every time, how to prepare food and then how to, you know, you know, so uh, the prepared food based on Western, Western flavor and palate. So then, uh, you know, you're not really, you know, uh, kind of, you don't have to worry. If you go to some other country, you, you know, you cannot really digest the local, local food directly and then that's why we we have an experience that's the reason that you know that i have a western cultural experience is because i know what exactly you know take care of my western friend <laughs> and family over there so that's how 
you know, that's the difference between our company and other companies. We have both sides of knowledge so that we can really, you know, kind of uh, um, collaborate. And then uh, we, because we really want to take care of our clients, we want to give them a good experience uh, so that we try to do every little detail to make sure that nobody is hungry <laughs> and nobody is fed that uh, the food they don't like it. So we have a lot of choices. We have continental food. We sometimes are quick make a pizza. Sometimes, you know, uh, except uh, hamburger, we make pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank that's you something, so much. Yeah. That's uh, something, you know, we really, really uh, uh, pay attention uh, because if, uh, you know, the food you eat is everything, you know, it rely that food rely on, you know, uh, your health, your well-being, everything. So, yeah. So, you know, sometimes I would, uh, I would honestly say this, you know, sometimes might, might not be exactly the, the, the one you eat here. Can be a little bit different. <laughs> but then you, that, uh, what I always tell my clients is to adapt the different is the, is a very, you know, uh, important for our human life, you know, because everything is changing in our life. Nothing is the same. And then if our mind is stuck with the same thing while the things are keep changing, that's the problem. So that's the good things to learn for our life, you know, adapting, you know, adjusting based on the little bit change. The little bit change is very good, but I don't promise here that we're going to give you the exact same the coffee you drink <laughs> exact pizza that you eat here it can happen you know it's part of the nature we cannot go against the nature this is how we train our mind to be able to adapt to adjust you know but some usually we human being when things are naturally not still the same every day and then we think you know i need same thing again and again and we disappoint too much our mind, you know. That's, that's I think, we, that's the whole uh, purpose of the trip is to change your and transform your mind so that we can, we can you know, uh, live in any, any situation and any environment very resilient way. That's something is very important of this trip. So that's why I I don't form, I don't want to promise that we will not give exactly the same. You know that is everything gonna be changed. Even though you feel the same, <laughs> the the coffee you drink every morning same. In reality, that coffee is different every day. You know. So we cannot have the same thing every day. So, yeah. And, and Karma, if I might yeah. interject. So, so well. whole this trip, yeah, the whole this trip is I, yeah, we love to kind of, uh, you know, uh, help our mind while we've been stuck in with the same thing <laughs> and then assuming the same thing when the reality is not same, you know. You know, that's the problem a lot of my, our clients have it. You know, when I guide the trip, you know, people always have, you know, this coffee is not same. You know, this, you know, sometimes we love to complain, but the, we have to know the reality. You know, the reality, when we know the reality, you know, our disappointment is disappear. You know, that's the power of our mind. That's, a, that, that's what I call is the mental transformation <laughs> to understand so that you can adjust and you can live anywhere very happy without no complaint and no disappoint. So that is very good for our health, you know, but sometimes, you know, uh, living in Western here in America for 20 years, I know exactly, you know, uh, what people expect and how people, you know, uh, what people mind are, you know. So that's my job is to make sure to understand the reality, not just the, our assumption, you know. And right? Tom, if I might interject. Sure. Um, like my next door neighbor, Randy, who yeah. uh, did the Everspace camp with, trek with us 
with his son, who I think he did it. He was about 69 when he did it. Um, Randy has climbed every 14er. He's hiked all over the world. He's traveled everywhere and, you know, in-depth exposure to various cultures. And he went on our trek and he likes to speak to other clients to say that we really should market this as a culinary delight um, because <laughs> he enjoyed the food absolutely so much. And so I just want to throw that out there on, on behalf yeah, of Sometimes, uh, one thing I like to add, sometimes, you know, we have a tea that, uh, you know, salty, uh, traditional Sherpa tea. And then uh, my Western friend who would never used to have that uh, kind of tea, when they sip it, then they say, okay, this is very yucky, and then this is uh, not good, and things like that. And then I said, well, even though you don't like, try a couple times, uh, multiple times. Then once you do multiple times, then you used to it. So, you know, I, you know, when I come to America, before I come to America, we didn't have much sugar. You know, I didn't like uh, the sugar tea, right? <laughs> After I've, I come here, then I try the sugar tea uh, oftentimes, more and more, even though I don't enjoy it. And now I will finally, I overcome that challenge. <laughs> then I said, now I can drink sugar tea. And now I can do my, uh, you know, salt tea. Both, I have a choice. But then those who don't try, they have only one choice for life. You know, that's why we have to learning. You know, we have to, you know, try the things that were not comfortable, things or we don't like it. You know, the more we do it, it becomes more, you know, familiar, more easier. So that's something, you know, beautiful of our life, our mind is to change, you know, change. We cannot, you know, we change ourselves, change ourselves and transform ourselves. That's the whole, whole purpose of my, you know, the core mission of Sherpa Mountain Adventure is not only kind of manipulate people's mind, you know, <laughs> but then introduce the reality and, you know, helping them to change and transform well, the mind. Yeah. Karma, that ties, that ties in very well with the, what we'll be working with the, the youth on uh, as far as mindfulness. Yeah. And that block and what we do. Okay. Before going sure, sure. There too. Yeah. So, that's a, that's yeah. A, that point of view, you know, that's why I, will, I wouldn't say that food is going to be the same like here, 100%, but it's very relevant, very, you know, uh, very similar, yeah. I wasn't asking, you know, about the, the food being the same as what we have here in, in Boulder. Um, I actually, if I were going, I would be looking forward to uh, experiencing the local cuisine because, oh, yeah. you know, sure, sure. I, 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 yeah, I a way of uniting people. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. So there would, be there would be combination uh, of the local cuisine. And then some until you get uh, used to it, you know, very gradually. So that's the question most of our client have, and that's the challenge we, you know, few couple, you know, like a two to three days that uh, you know every, you know, my Western client have that kind of mental challenge to to make a transaction. So that period, so we will very helpful. Uh, we try to, you know, accommodate whatever is, you know, needed. But then our goal is to gradually to, you know, yeah, to change. And the other and thing, if on. I might, just to finish this thread before we move on is, you know, a lot of the food that we'll eat over there is uh, cultivated right there. So the vegetables are fresh and grown, you know, bok choy, they grow at very high elevations. And, you know, on the, you'll be just below Mount Everest and you'll see bok choy gardens and, um, so everything, the vegetables are very fresh. Um, and so it, it's, you'll be eating a lot of dal bat, which is the, the food of Nepal. And so we'll certainly have plenty of the, the local fare. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, that was um, quite a, an astonishing um, answer. Karma, thank you. We just had a beautiful spiritual lesson um, based in how they will eat. So thank you for that, because I think about what this journey will mean for these students at this time in their life as they look towards um, leaving Shining Mountain and their high school time um, and then having um, facing life and things being different than their custom in their home. So it's a 
it's a perfect, perfect um, opportunity for them to, to feel change, to experience change, and to understand that they can adapt and um, in themselves and, and with the world around them. So I love that you just brought it that way. Thank you. That was, that was a gift. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I have a couple of comments to share with you from some of the families. Um, Lisa says, very grateful for the descriptions, maps, pictures, and overall picture of the trip. This brings it to life beautifully. What an experience. Thank you for your time and energy, Karma and Eric, and for the adventure to come. And then Chris Barnett says, can we all chaperone? Um, and because I think we're drawing straws. I think everyone wants to go. Everyone wants the chance. All the faculty want to go. I don't know who's going to teach school during that time <laughs> because the entire faculty and staff will be there. So anyway, yeah, I hear you, Chris. <laughs> Um, let's see, I don't see any other comments or questions in the chat box. Is there, is there anything else that anyone wants to share or ask at this time? Um, what a wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm so grateful to you both. Alex, please thank him again for being here and sharing his experience with us, not only um, for having been on this trek, but also as a student at Shining Mountain Waldorf High School. Um, so lovely to hear from Alex. Um, anyone else? I, I think uh, Alex did uh, the trek through uh, Shepherd Mountain Adventure, I think, yeah. isn't it? I think, yeah. yeah. Alex and his whole family, Tim. Yes, the whole family. I remember seeing the pictures, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, well, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, community, and then, you know, uh, so we are all connected each other. So, you know, we, uh, is our uh, job is to make sure that everybody, you know, uh, you know, uh, who needs help, and then we want to make sure that you know we all help each other and make this trip, you know, very valuable and then very. Uh, you know, uh, good one for your child life, you know, children. You know, I, as I said, I have two children. Uh, one is, uh, you know, now 14 years. He is going to Monarch High School from this, uh, this fall. And I have a little one, three years old. Uh, she's taking um, uh, like, uh, like a preschool. So I, as a parent, I understand. And then how important and then I take my children over there, and then, you know, when we do things together with the parent, it's very exciting. You know, I, you know, I have an experience, and then, so as a parent, so uh, yeah, we will make sure that we will take care very good your children, while we try to give them opportunity to grow, and then you know, help them to you know, get their you know uh the the goal or whatever you know so there are so many things to learn uh, when we <laughs> through each other so that's uh, something i'm very excited and then yeah thank you so much for the opportunity so thank you um jamie did you have anything else I can't think of any questions, just, you know, all of uh, you who joined us this evening. Um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to getting to know you and your children and the other families in the school. So if you're around on the 31st, please stop by the high school and meet us and some of the new faculty members. And um, one, I'd love to hear your stories. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. and. Um, Thank you so much, Karma and Eric. This is so exciting. I'm not even going to put my straw in the running because I know there's so many others ahead of me, but <laughs> maybe one day. I've got two little girls myself, so we'll go to high school one day. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that will be um, another time, you know, <laughs> good time. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody. Um, it's greatly appreciated. It's been fun. We can, I can do these presentations every night of the year. <laughs> it's just yeah. so fun. Yeah.
And yeah. I know we've got numerous Sherpa Mountain families that are scheduled for other treks that we do in the Three Pass and Everest. So there's a lot of people from the community who's a part of this in various ways. And uh, so it's just going to be exciting to, to do this and to, to be able to see the students and work with the students before the trek, experience them on the trek, and then to experience them after the trek is going to be so thrilling for us and for me and to have them have some agency in how we evolve this and move forward as well. So it's very exciting and uh, look forward to many, many years of fruitful trekking. That's great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here with us this evening, Karma and Eric, and all of you parents who are here. Thank you for being here. We have recorded um, this evening's presentation, so we'll be able to share it with the other families and share it with the middle school parents too. I'm sure they'll be interested to see what's what's going to be available for their kids as they move into the high school. So um, if other questions arise, please feel free um, to be in touch with Jamie or with me. Um, if there are questions that we can't answer, we will reach out to Carmen and Eric for those answers. Um, there's certainly more information to come and we're very, very excited to be able to offer this opportunity to our students. Um, and I don't think they want the school director to go, but I'm thinking about going in disguise. <laughs> I really want to go. Um, but anyway, so yeah, good. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer days. I look forward to seeing you all very soon in person on the campus and to meet our new families, not just here on a screen. We welcome you. We're so glad that you're joining us in our high school program this year and, and meeting your students and uh, a very, very warm welcome to you. And um, enjoy the rest of summer and we'll see you hopefully on the 31st. Okay. Bye, yeah. everybody. Good night, all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.